it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Jingfeng Zhang. Um, so Dr. Jingfeng Zhang got his PhD from, uh, um, from a school of computing uh, at the National University of Singapore uh, two years ago. And now uh, he's a postdoctoral researcher at Riken in Japan, uh, working with uh, uh, Masashi Sujiyama. And he has been doing a lot of interesting work in basic uh, trustworthy AI, especially on uh, poisoning attacks. So uh, yeah, I, I will not say very much. Uh, I will give you more time. So whenever you are ready, Jingfeng, please start. And it's so nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank, thank you for Prof. John's great introduction. Uh, I'm really glad to be here to present my work, Adversarial Learning, the Improvements and Applications. Um, Today's I'm going to cover four aspects, uh, the background of adversarial robustness, the foundations, uh, two applications, and future perspective. Um, let's uh, move on to the point one. Uh, adversarial attack is a way of evaluating the vulnerability of machine learning models. It is because machine learning models are so vulnerable to the input perturbation. For example, uh, with the only small noise, the image of pig will be wrongly recognized as airline. How could we construct the adversarial data? We basically solve a constraint optimization problem given a machine learning model uh, and its loss function we output an adversarial data, maximizing the law within the non-ball constraint. The non-ball constraint, the same semantic meaning between natural data and adversarial data. The epsilon controls the size of the non-ball. Uh, project grading decent PGD approximately solved this constraint optimization problem. Given a starting point, PGD calculates a gradient of loss function with respect to the input. Gradient is a direction pointing to a place with a slightly larger loss. Now we get a new point whose loss is slightly larger than the natural data. Then we calculate the gradient again. The loss of yellow point is again larger. So on and so forth. Finally, we get a red point with the highest loss, which can make machine learning model inaccurate. Why a uh, machine learning model are so vulnerable to the adversarial attack? It is because standard training output a model whose decision boundary is near the data. Therefore, when we slightly perturb the near decision boundary data, the model will make mistakes. Even worse, due to the curse of dimensionality, almost all data are near the decision boundary. To meet the above challenge, we have a new learning star that is adversarial learning. Adversarial learning has two purposes. First is to correctly classify the data that is increase natural accuracy on natural test data. Second, unlike standard training, adversarial training outputs a thick decision boundary. The data are encouraged further away from the decision boundary. The learning objective of the vanilla adversarial training is the minimax formulation. Inside, there's a maximization where we use PGD to generate the adversarial data within the null ball. Outside, there's a minimization where we find a classifier to feed those generated adversarial data. To realize this learning objective, we use alternating optimization. At, at each epoch, adversarial training conducts step one and step two alternatively. Step one is to generate maximizing loss adversarial data, commonly using the PGD method. Step two is to minimize the loss on those generated adversarial data. In comparison, 
at each epoch, standard training only learn from the natural data. However, adversarial training has various issues. For example, it hurts standard generalization, that is degradating natural accuracy on natural test data. It also has limited robustness gain. That means there exists very low robust accuracy on those robust adversarial test data. It also has undesirable robust overfitting. That is the robust accuracy first climbs, then drops over the training epochs. Next, I'm going to cover three aspects on how to improve the adversarial training. That is in terms of generalization robustness and undesirable robust overfitting. Many empirical studies have found that vanilla adversarial training degrades the natural accuracy. Why? It is because there exists the crossover mixture problem. Let's look at the toy example on the left. The adversarial data of different classes overshoot into its peers error. In the real world CIFAR-10 example, this crossover mixture problem may not happen in the input cities, but in the middle layers. Let's look at example of layer seven of eight layer convolutional neural network. The adversarial data get significantly mixed at layer seven. To tackle the crossover mixture problem, we have our main main formulation. The outer minimization keeps the same as the vanilla adversarial training, but in the inner optimization, we generated our friendly adversarial data. Specifically, instead of maximizing the loss, we minimize the loss. However, this minimization have to meet two constraints. First, the adversarial data should be wrongly classified. Second, the loss of the adversarial data is slightly larger than the desired loss by a small margin rule. Let's look at the comparison. When adversarial data are wrongly predicted, our friendly adversarial data is less adversarial than the most adversarial data. When the adversarial data are correctly predicted, there are no constraints on our friendly adversarial data. Let's look at the theoretical results. Adversarial risk can be decomposed into two terms, which capture the two purposes of the adversarial training. That is correctly classify the natural data and make the decision boundary thick. Our main main formulation can actually facilitate a tighter upper bound on the adversarial risk by just changing the maximization to minimization when adversarial data are wrongly predicted. Um, to realize our main main formulation, we use our early stopped PGD. In early stopped PGD, the K is a maximum, maximum allowed PGD step number for searching the adversarial data. Step tall control of the number of extra steps once the adversarial data are misclassified. Please note that when tall equal to K, our early stop PGD recovers the conventional PGD method. Let's look at the toy example on the left. The friendly adversarial data are scattered near the decision boundary in the learning process, which can actually fine tune the learning process. Um, in the real world CIFAR, CIFAR data set, uh, the crossover mixture problem may not happen at input space but in the middle layer. Therefore, I plot out two class, class data at layer seven, 
we can clearly see that the natural data do not get mixed at all. By comparison, the most adversarial data generated by the conventional PGD get significantly mixed. In contrast, our friendly adversarial data generated by our early stopped PGD can significantly relieve this crossover mixture problem. Um, therefore, compared with the vanilla adversarial training, our friendly adversarial training should have a better natural accuracy and enabling larger difference radius epsilon training. In the CFR dataset, we compare the vanilla adversarial training and our friendly adversarial training of various difference radius ranging from 0 0.03 to 0 0.15 in L infinite non ball constraint. Then we test the performance using, using the three evaluation metric one natural test accuracy and two robust accuracy with two attack strength. That's an epsilon test. The purple line represents the vanilla adversarial training by matrix. The red, orange, and green line represent our friendly adversarial training with different tall. Let's look at the left, fi left figure. Clearly, the friendly adversarial training has a better natural accuracy. In comparison with the large difference radius, vanilla adversarial training fails due to its severe crossover mixture problem. Please note that fat with larger tau is more and more similar to the vanilla adversarial training. It also suffers from the crossover mixture problem. Last but not least, our friendly adversarial training can defend against large epsilon test because the training of the friendly adversarial training is more stable under the larger epsilon train. Um, besides the performance gain, our friendly adversarial training is more computationally efficient than the vanilla adversarial training. Specifically, we calculate the average backward propagation per epoch. Backward propagation is the most time consuming calculation in training the machine learning model. The dashed line minus those solid lines are the saved computation budget by our friendly adversarial training. All right, we, we, we now understand friendly adversarial training has better stability, therefore has a better natural accuracy. What next? Next, can we improve further improve the adversarial robustness. That is robust accuracy on adversarial test data. Let's look at the two observations. First, adversarial training's error is hardly reaching zero. Even we use a larger model compared with the standard training in red line, adversarial training's error cannot reach zero easily. Second, slightly larger epsilon training leads to significantly larger training error, which signifies the insufficient model capacity. Why this is the case? We know that adversarial training employs the adversarial data to reduce the sensitivity of model's output with respect to the small changes around is natural data. During the training process, adversarial data are generated on the fly and are adaptively changes based on the current model to smooth the local neighborhood of natural data. But the volume of this local neighborhood is exponentially high with respect to the input dimension. Therefore, model capacity is often not enough for adversarial training. 
Second, the data actually have a different degree of robustness. More attackable data are closer to the class boundary. More guarded data are further away from the class boundary. Therefore, given the limited model capacity, we really should treat data differently. Therefore, our idea is for updating the model, we explicitly give larger weights on the loss of the adversarial data whose natural counterparts are closer to the decision boundary. To realize this idea in all outside outer minimization, we add instant dependent weight assignment function omega. And the, in the in, inner optimization, we can keep the same as the vanilla adversarial training or our friendly adversarial training. The instant uh, dependent weight assignments function omega should be inversely proportional to the distance to the decision boundary. And this distance should be proportional to the PGD step number. We name the PGD step number as kappa value. That is the number of PGD steps that can generate a misclassified adversarial data. Therefore, large kappa data is guarded. Small kappa data is attackable. We call kappa as data's geometry value. In the bottom left panel, we give two instant reweighting function omega as example denoted by blue line and yellow line. The guarded data will be assigned less weight compared with those attackable data here. Next, I'm going to show instant reweighting techniques is very effective in enhancing the adversarial robustness. Uh, here are some graphs. Let me take you through the data. Let's look at the number one from the top right panel. Uh, vanilla adversarial training denoted by the red line has an undesirable issue of robust overfitting. The robust test error is getting decreased, then increased, while the, while the robust training error is only decreasing. Let's look at the bottom left panel here. Vanilla adversarial training engenders large number of guarded data, overwhelming the small number of attackable data over the training process. This shows that learning more from the guarded data is more harmful than good. By comparison, when we reduce the learning weight on those guarded data, the robust test accuracy gets significantly boosted. This also causes very little harm on the natural accuracy. In addition, we also want to know what happened for the decision boundary. Therefore, I plotted the gradient magnitude of loss function with respect to the adversarial data to measure the curvature of the decision boundary. I found that my method can facilitate a flatter decision boundary than vanilla adversarial training. However, our instant reweighting uh, method cannot fully resolve the undesirable robust overfitting. To this end, I also provide a simple but extremely effective technique that is randomly flipping the training data label on the fly and increase the train flipping rates over the training epochs. This method is so effective across various type, types of adversarial training method or and various types of uh, data sets. Uh, besides, I have supervised students uh, further enhancing adversarial robustness and to deal with various situations. For example, adversarial robustness meet 
uh, network structure, multiple models, limited or incomplete data, and some corrupted features. Next, I'm going to cover the how to apply the adversarial robustness. Just now we understand adversarial attack is a way of uncovering the vulnerability of machine learning model. And adversarial training is to output a robust model to be against such the attack. Um, next, I will show two case studies using adversarial attack to evaluate the vulnerability and using adversarial training to enhance the adversarial robustness in deep image denoiser and non-parametric to sample test. Um, deep image denoising is to reconstruct the clean image from their noisy observation. Therefore, it's commonly used in medical images, satellites, and cameras. In image denoising, the noise is generally considered to be the random variable with zero, zero mean. For example, if you take a large number of pixels and compute their average, the noise should be canceled out. Otherwise, the noise, the noise will affect the brightness of the, the image. Because of this zero mean property, traditional method in OpenCV package using the non-local mean denoising, the idea is simple. Given an image, we find a similar patches, then average out the noise. Now, we go to the machine learning time, and we need to learn a good image denoiser. Specifically, the image denoiser is denoted as a deep neural network, taking input the noisy image and giving output a clean image. However, in practice, we only have a clean images as the training data. To solve this, we construct noisy image by adding Gaussian noise with zero mean of various levels. Then we can learn a good deep image denoiser that performs much better than the non-local mean denoising method. However, although the deep neural network has good performance, it is vulnerable to adversarial attacks. Similarly, this also applies to the deep image denoiser. To explore this, we ask a research question. What kind of zero mean noise that make deep image denoiser fails? To answer the above question, we design zero mean adversarial attack to evaluate the vulnerability of deep image denoiser. To realize this attack, we use the PGD method. But this PGD method ha must have to meet two constraints, which is different from the conventional one. First, the noise should be bounded by the adversarial budget. Second, the noise should meet the zero mean property. To realize this, we customized the projection function pi in the PGD method. Therefore, the most interesting part is the projection pi that meets the two constraints. Um, to meet the zero mean property, the projection pi should project the adversarial noise onto the zero mean plane. The zero mean plane consists of the vector whose mean of its elements equals zero. Then how could we project a vector delta onto a plane? First, we find an an all one vector that is orthogonal to the plane. 
Then we project the vector delta along the direction of this all one vector. Then the adversarial noise delta minus this new projection leads to the new vector that is on the zero main plane. Therefore, the black, black vector is what we want. Now, we have our two-step projection pi. The first step is to meet the zero main constraint. The second step is to meet the adversarial budget constraint. For example, we can clearly see here, the deep image denoiser can effectively handle the normally noisy image and remove the noise to reconstruct the clear, clear image. By comparison, if this noise is crafted by our zero mean attacks, the performance of deep image denoiser is severely destroyed. We can clearly see some blurs remaining on the roof as some strange contours appearing in the sky. Therefore, our zero mean attack can indeed uncover the vulnerability of the deep image denoiser. Then, can we make deep image denoiser robust? The solution is adversarial training. We add an additional loss term to encourage the output of adversarially noisy image to be similar of the normally noisy image. Therefore, we train the deep image denoiser using both, both adversarially noisy image and the naturally noisy image to ensure that the reconstruction quality is high and the reconstruction is robust. To realize this learning objective, we alternatively use PGD method to generate the adversarial noise and then minimize the above, above two loss terms with respect to the model parameters. Then compared with the standard training, our adversarial training can ensure that, uh, ensure the reconstruction quality and their attacks. Last but not least, we surprisingly found that the robustness of deep image denoiser can also benefit the generalization capacity on unseen real world noise. In other words, robust deep image denoiser can denoise the real world noise even without training on the real world noisy image. We guess it's because adversarial attack could exploit the worst case noise. Learning from those worst case noise can make deep image, deep image denoiser deal with unseen types of noise. Let's look at another example on how to apply the adversarial robustness. The two sample test is a statistical hypothesis testing, judging whether the two set of samples are drawn from the same distributions. It is widely used to analyze the critical data in physics, chemistry, biology, so on and so forth, to check whether their, their scientific experiments has, have made significant changes or not. Um, then how to test? First, we're going to define a test statistic. The test statistic measures how different the two batch of data are. Then we compute the p-value. P-value is the probability of observing this test statistic given the null hypothesis, that is two distribution are the same. If this probability is very low, we're going to reject this null hypothesis. Let's look at example. We have two batches of apples of various size from two companies. We want to know whether these two batch of apples have the same quality. 
first, we calculate the T test statistic. XP bar, XP bar is the average of these five apples. XQ bar is average of these five apples. Sigma, sigma P is the standard deviation of these five apples, and sigma Q is standard deviation of these five apples. NP equal to five, NQ equal to five. Suppose we get a value of minus 2.44. We really want to know whether this value is large enough to tell any differences. Then we look at the distribution density function of the T statistic. We found that the probability of this statistic under the null hypothesis is very low. Then we have to reject the null hypothesis. We conclude that these two batch of apples have different qualities. In practice, the T test is very limited, which cannot handle the complex distributions. Therefore, we need to use the general purpose test statistic. However, computing quantiles of those complicated test statistics under the null hypothesis is very tricky. To solve this, we can estimate the quantiles using the permutation test. Under the null hypothesis, we randomly shuffle the joint set, set of SP and SQ into S1 and S2 set. We can treat S1 and S2 set follow, follow the same distribution. Then we calculate the test statistic of L, S1 and S2 set, uh, set. Then we repeat. For example, we repeat this process 1,000 times. Then we can plot the empirical CDF of the test statistic under the null hypothesis. Finally, we can locate our test statistic of SP and SQ here. Then one minus this value is our calculated P value of our test statistic of LP, SP and SQ. Now I will introduce a general purpose test statistic, maximum mean discrepancy, MMD. MMD measures the differences between distribution of P and Q, which is the largest dif differences in expectation over all functions. However, we only have limited data. We must restrict the function class to provide powerful finite sample estimates. And we also want this function class, curly F, to be rich enough to become flexible. Therefore, we choose this function class, F, curly F, to be the unit ball in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, RKHS. Then we define a kernel embedding to embed the distribution into infinite dimensional feature space. This can allow us to compare and manipulate distribution using dot products. Due to this reproducing property, we can make the soup disappear and use kernels to calculate and compare the two distributions. If the MMD equal to zero, the two distributions are the same. Uh, we, we, we actually have a different estimation to estimate the MMD. Let's make the notation simple. We denote MMD hat square uh, estimation by kernel K parameterized by theta. Then how to test you with MMD? 
we first, we fix a kernel and its parameters. For example, using Gaussian kernel and fixed its length scale. Then given SP and SQ, two set of data, we calculate the MMD estimation. Then we use the permutation test to estimate the p-value of the calculated statistic. Lastly, if this p-value is very small, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Otherwise, we'll set the null hypothesis. Now we go to the machine learning time. We should really learn the kernel parameters from the data. We can use deep kernel and the data are parameterized by a deep neural network. Then how to learn the parameter theta? First, we split the data into the training set and a test set. Then we define a learning objective and optimize the deep kernel to learn the kernel parameters. Then we conduct the two sample test using this optimized kernel. The next question is how to define a learning objective? The learning objective is a test power. The test power is a probability of correctly rejecting the null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is true. Due to the asymptotic of MMD and the alternative hypothesis, we use a central limit theorem. R is the rejection threshold decided by the permutation test. Big theta, big sigma is a CDF of the standard normal distribution. Then for reasonably large n, the test power is dominated by the first term. To compute the first term, we estimate it using the kernel operations, which are parameterized by the theta. Finally, we can obtain this optimized deep kernel by maximizing the test power on the training data. Then the two sample test with the optimized deep kernel will have a very powerful testing ability can tell tiny differences between two complex distributions. Now we consider a potential risk that causes a malfunction of a non-parametric two sample test. To this end, we use the PGD method to minimize the test power to search for the adversarial pairs. For example, we have a lovely image of cats and dogs. Almost all the non-parametric two-sample tests can correctly differentiate the benign pairs of cats and dogs coming from the different distribution. But they will wrongly judge the adversarial pairs. They think they are coming from the same distributions. To robustify the non-parametric two-sample test, we propose to adversarially learn the robust kernel. In particular, the defense is formulated as a max-min optimization that has a similar taste of adversarial training's minimax formulation. For its realization, we firstly generate the adversarial pairs by minimizing the test power in the inner minimization. Then we update the kernel parameters by maximizing the test power on the adversarial pairs in outer maximization. Therefore, we can output a robust kernel. The two sample test with our robust kernel can resist against adversarial attacks while maintaining the good test capacity. Therefore, the, the typical message is traditional method 
have a have limited performance. Now we go to the machine learning method, which can boost the performance, but are vulnerable. Then we really should need uh need those robust machine learning method, which can have have a good performance, and are robust against various various types of attacks. Next, I'm going to uh, talk about some future perspectives uh, and, and my experiences so far. Uh, I, have, I have secured uh, several grants uh, serving as the, the PI of multiple projects. The first one is this, this courage adversarial attacks while improving the adversarial training. It is a three year uh, project. Um, it it can it uh, win me around sixty thousand USD. Uh, the second one is adversarial robustness means in perfect training set. Uh, it is a two year project. It secured me around thirty five thousand USD. Uh, the the third one is a recently accepted project. That is evaluating and enhancing the reliability of semi-supervised learning. It is a uh, uh, give me around twenty-three thousand USD. Um, uh, and my vision, uh, long-term vision is to build a secure and responsible machine learning environment. Uh, to uphold my vision, I would like to get started with the following two proposals. Uh, I would like to, uh, the, the first one is, I will tell, tell those details later. The first one is adversarial robustness at large scale foundation model. The second one is discovering weaknesses of recent algorithm or methods. I really like to advocate for the notion that besides accuracy, robustness is an important benchmark in our AI systems. Uh, let, let me talk, let, talk about my two proposals in detail. What is the foundation model? Foundation model is a large model, uh, training from a large, large scale and curated uh, data with multi-modality, for example, audios, image, a text, uh, and so on. Uh, the, this foundation model can be reusable to power various downstream applications. For example, healthcare, uh, education, uh, court, and empowering some small enterprise. However, we should be really cautious about using the foundation model because the security issue of the foundation model are inherited by all downstream applications. For example, an attacker can manipulate the uncurated data by inserting some uh, poisoning data, which can manipulate the foundation model and subsequently affecting all the downstream applications. Second, if this foundation model is an intellectual property owned by a company, model stealing could be another issue. Thirdly, there could be some illegal usage of the foundation model. For example, hacking privacy, uh, re reprogramming to com commit crimes or adversarial attacks. Um, therefore, in the future, I would like to propose to design those attacks that can evaluate the vulnerability of the foundation model. Besides, I also need to understand why those attacks could happen and design some defense to enhance the foundation model's robustness. Second, uh, recently there are many new learning algorithms and machine learning powered applications that are in invented to handle various aspects. 
for example, to handle noisy labor, there are, no, there are many noisy labor learning algorithms to handle adversarial attacks. There are many adversarial learning algorithms to handle unlabeled data. There are semi-supervised learning or unsupervised learning. Uh, besides, machine learning also significantly enhance the accuracy of those traditional methods. For example, deep kernel two sample test deep image denoiser, and even learning-based binary code similarity detection. Similarity binary code similarity detection is often used in our computer system to detect any mild wires. My, yeah. Um, those recent uh, algorithm or methods will be finally integrated in our AI system as a, as a candidate option to handle various aspects. Therefore, at this moment, it is urgent for us to understand where the weaknesses of those recent algorithm and methods. Then I'm going to develop the robust counterparts to tackle those weaknesses. Um, uh, then I talk slightly about my experiences. Uh, I have uh, given uh, the guest lectures uh, in the University of Tokyo uh, in the topic of trustworthy machine learning. I have uh, also given uh, many talks across different research institutes, uh, workshops, and at the universities. I have, I have also served as uh, organizer, uh, leading organizer of workshops and seminars, and ex have examined the PhD uh, thesis at two university. And also I have served as reviewers of many top conferences and journals. Uh, also, I, I, have also, I have been advising students and one of them ha have obtained PhD degree recently, success successfully. Um, yeah, thank you. This is the end of my today's talk. Um, Thank you for uh, all attending my talk. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jingfeng. Uh, it's uh, very insightful. So uh, uh, great, thank you very much. Now we have time for a couple of questions. So if you have questions, please just, uh, you can either leave a message in the chat box or you can just raise your hand. Okay. While we are waiting, uh, it takes time for the participants to respond, I guess. So, uh, okay, let me just uh, start with some um, technical questions on the technical side. So it's sure. quite interesting, to, for instance, you, into, you uh, mentioned ideas of tuning kernel parameters in order to uh, maximize the power of the two-sample test. So uh, it's, uh, it's really nice. Uh, so could you please go back to that, that part and uh, um, just explain the basic logic there, essentially it's about what you take as input, right? And why it is possible for you to maximize the power when you actually don't know whether they are really um, the same distribution. So maybe you can just talk about the, uh, right here, the logic. Uh, yeah, so yeah. you have a, a, uh, a basic, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the, the idea is here. If you can find uh, any mapping that can, can tell the differences of two sets of data, actually they are different distribution. If we really cannot find it, actually they are the same. So we, the we try to... is, uh, sorry, uh, the problem is you may have overfitting, right? So even if uh, they are, they are, they are uh, yeah. the same, true, right? It's hard for you to find a kind to amplify uh, different uh, aspects of the random error. That's why that's the problem you want to avoid. So yeah, how could you avoid that issue? Yeah, th this is not my issue actually. I, I, yeah, I, know, I, I know, I know, I know this. Yeah. It's just because we use the training, um, yeah, we use the training set to maximize it, and use the test set to do the to the to do the test. We cannot use the training set, otherwise you have exactly the issue you mentioned. So it's technically wrong to use the training set. Yeah, I see. So you have okay. You divide. Uh, you have two that You mean you have two. That says, you know, to avoid that kind of overfitting. I see. Yeah. Okay. 
Yes. Uh, cool. Let's see. Oh, oh, we have a question here from uh, uh, Long Kang. So thanks for your talk. And have you explored any those methods to uh, backdoor attack, which is another uh, type of attack? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, for example, I have explored the adversarial robustness, uh, its relationship uh, with the backdoor opposing attacks on these two pieces of work. work. Uh, this one is understanding the adversarial trainings with backdoor attacks. And this one is, uh, I try to launch the pausing attacks to actively to, to evaluate the adversarial training. You can read these two papers, Ho hopefully it can help. Yes, uh, yeah, I did, yes, yeah. Uh, is that answer to your question? Okay. Cool. So I think uh, we are waiting for more questions. Uh, okay, great. So uh, let, let me ask another question. So clearly adversarial attacks um, are a big problem, right? Um, uh, in multiple ways. So, uh, and clearly detecting adversarial attacks and uh, trying to um, deal with uh, adversarial attacks, right? It would be one way or one immediate way to uh, yes. solve the problem. Do you think this yeah. is a really, in the long run, do you think that's really the, the right way to um, achieve something like trustworthy AI? Um, uh, I mean the following thing. So essentially, as long as you learn, right? Your learning machine works this way. Uh, I can always design some kind of adversarial uh, attack um, procedures, right? If you know how the the serial attack um, procedures work, then you can always try to do something to defend your uh, your machine, right? But do you think there could be a fundamentally different way to design machine learning models to avoid the serial attacks? Um, yeah, this is uh, actually this, this debate is a uh, is a long long is a long debate. It's kind of like an attacker and a defender actually are in you know, an endless game. Uh, we really need to understand each other and make ourselves better. Like know yourself and know, know ourselves and design the corresponding strategy. Uh, in terms of your, 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 your first question, if you think whether the detect, detection method would be a, a future solution, I don't think so. If an attacker don't know the detection method, how, how it operate, probably yes. But finally, those attacker will know the how those detection will operate in, in the inside the inside the AI system. They will design some uh, mechanism, new attacks to attack this uh, detection method. Yeah. Therefore it's not uh, it's still yeah not an ultimate solution. Uh, right right. Therefore it's kind of like an endless game. Yeah the answer is have to have to see that, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so now, I, uh, oh, th thank you. Uh, I will follow up on that uh, a bit later. So uh, here we have a question from uh, Dr. Uh, Mohamed Yakub. Can you please uh, comment on how adversarial attacks on CNs might be different than on vision uh, transformer? Right, right, right. Um, there, are, there are many recent research on robustness of vision transformer. The first research is show that vision transformer is more robust than the convolutional neural network. But later in this, this year, SML, uh, SAR, they show that vision transformer is very vulnerable to the patch attack because it's a tension mechanism. Therefore, but the convolutional neural network is very robust against this patch attack. So we really cannot see, we cannot tell vision transformer is more robust than CN or CN is more robust than vision transformer. So then there, there's a, this year's CVPR paper just combine the vision transformer and convolution neural network together. Let's make, let's, let's make a bundle, combine two together. Yeah, so it's, yeah, so, the answer is we really cannot uh, see which one is more robust. Uh, I believe vision transformer right now actually have a good good power, good capacity, 
but still have a very big security issue at this moment. Is have a large room to exploit. Uh, great. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mohammed. If that's the if that's not the answer to your question, please let us know. And yeah, cool. So uh, clearly, you are you are very familiar with the literature. So here, let me make um, this point, and probably you can you comment on it. Clearly, if you design machine learning procedures and models this way, as you just mentioned, uh, we can have uh, attacks and um, uh, attacks and kind of approach it to define it right uh, endlessly. So basically, you can always design new methods to a text system, and you can always find new ways. Uh, to uh, define your system based on understanding of the attacks. Yeah. But what's the fundamental reason? So basically, I see it's because machines and human beings do not derive and make use of the same kind of high level features. We may have the same input, right? We look at images, uh, machines take uh, images as input. The problem is machines, and we don't have a principle for the machines so that they can also learn and make use of the same kind of feature representations. That also means yeah. that if we have a way so that machine can learn such representations, uh, there might not be a kind of uh, opportunity um, uh, for adversarial attacks, right? So from, right. That, from that perspective, it could be a fundamentally different way to avoid the adversarial attacks and to make sure that human beings and machines are aligned uh, in terms yeah. of the decision process. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, there's one fundamental challenge uh, in and uh, in this question in this direction is we do not have a mathematical tool to measure the our humans humans perception on differences. Uh, we have one L one null ball, L two null ball, L infinity null ball, but those mathematical ball is are not enough to measure how our humans. We we uh we uh see different things. Therefore, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe that that is a very fundamental uh question which limit this advancement in this era. But I believe that should be the future. We really need to align how our human perceive things and how our, how the machine see things. Yeah, yeah. So it's essentially right. Uh, those are kind of clearly machines and human beings are different, right, uh, by construction. Yes. But at the same time, you can see clearly we just need the principles. As long as we have, for, uh, we we can clearly formulate the principles and equip machines with such principles, right? It is clearly possible uh, for machines to and human beings to kind of uh, to uh, uh, make use of the same way to perceive the uh, sensory input, right? Um, yes. Okay. Cool. I, I think that might be a one another way to uh, make machine learning procedures or uh, models uh, uh, trustworthy, right? And eventually, we evaluate whether machines are trustworthy. So that means yeah. we have to understand ourselves first, and then we try to um, make sure machines do something consistent. Okay. Cool. Uh, let's see whether uh, it's a uh, noon time. Uh, so I guess that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Jim Fong. Uh, it's a kind of very comprehensive and uh, a very insightful talk. Uh, thank you very much. And also thank you very much thank for, ans for answering those questions in a very, very nice way. Okay, thanks. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, see you. See you.